Brian Mirescu is an author known for his writings on psychedelics and how they may have influenced many of the world's largest religions. In 2020, he published the book The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name, in which he elaborates on his theories. From his website, we can see that this book became a New York Times bestseller, and Audible named it one of the top five in their Best of 2020 history category. Murescu has since appeared on a number of big-name podcasts, such as the Joe Rogan Experience and Lex Friedman's podcast. I became familiar with Murescu after a friend of mine sent me a link to his appearance on the aforementioned Lex Friedman podcast. About half an hour in, Murescu mentioned that he wasn't certain about Jesus' historicity. That is, he had some reservations that Jesus actually walked the earth as a real human being. Now, this surprised me because the consensus among historians is that Jesus actually lived and was crucified around 30 AD. Murescu also stated that the story of Jesus was, quote, a recapitulation of the mysteries of Dionysus. Now, this really grabbed my attention, because people have been trying to claim that Jesus is a plagiarized version of ancient gods for a long time. And so far, every time I've heard one of these theories, they have been filled with significant flaws and the twisting of historical facts to create parallels where there are none. I wanted to investigate Murescu's claims further, so I got a copy of his book and I opened the section in which he drew these parallels. I'll put up an image of the first three pages in which he discusses the topic here. I've highlighted sections, or I guess I've outlined the ones that I'll analyze, and I've also numbered them in the order that I'll discuss them. Feel free to pause and zoom in and look at the whole page if you want to read the whole thing before we discuss it. The first quote from Murescu's book that I would like to investigate involves Murescu claiming that Dionysus called himself the Son of God in the 400 BC play Baki. Quote, The first two lines of the play stress the unusual bond between the wine god and his father in heaven. Dionysus calls himself the Son of God, or Dios Pace, and refers to his earthly mother as the young girl, or Kore, which could also be maiden or virgin, unquote. Here, Murescu is trying to demonstrate a parallel between Dionysus as depicted in Euripides' 400 BC play Baki and Jesus. Fortunately, I was able to find a dual-language version of the play, so we can look at the original language and its translation side by side. When we look at the section of the play Murescu mentions in the above quotation, we find a slightly different translation than the one Murescu provided. Instead of translating Dios Pace as Son of God, it is instead translated as Son of Zeus. If we turn to an ancient Greek dictionary, we can see why. Dios is simply the word for Zeus, specifically in the genitive singular, which in this case denotes possession, because Dionysus is Zeus's son. Of course, this makes complete sense, given that Dionysus was the child of an affair between Zeus and his human wife, Summele. Now, don't get me wrong, Zeus is a god, and as I understand it, he is the most powerful god in ancient Greek mythology. However, Murescu is still misrepresenting the text and exaggerating a parallel between Dionysus and Jesus when he directly translates Dios to God, and the reader is missing out on important information. Secondly, Murescu says Dionysus' use of the word kore could also mean virgin. If we look at this word in an ancient Greek dictionary, we see a number of possible meanings. Girl, young woman, maiden, bride, young wife, doll, puppet, pupil, a long sleeve, and the attic drachma. Though maiden, meaning an unmarried woman, is listed among the possible meanings, virgin is not. If we look at the dual language, the whole line of text is translated as follows. I, Dionysus, son of Zeus, born to him from Summele, Cadmus' daughter, Kore, delivered by a fiery midwife, Zeus's lightning flash. The reason Kore is translated here as daughter is because the word is preceded by Cadmus. In other words, what's being drawn to our attention is her father and her status as his daughter. There is no connotation of Summele being a virgin here. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, in ancient Greek mythology, as we already discussed, Semele, 
for Dionysus' mother, was born from her affair with Zeus. And thus, the idea that she was a virgin at this point is simply wrong. The second quote I'll discuss from Murescu's book deals with Dionysus again in Baki and how he would enter a human form in the play. Quote, So, in order to avoid scaring everybody to death with the full force of his godhood, the shapeshifter exchanges his divine form for a mortal one. Unquote. Credit where credit is due, Dionysus says something to this effect. He says, quote, Yes, I've changed my form from God to human. Unquote. However, this isn't unique to Dionysus. In fact, during most of Zeus's affair with Semele, he would take human form. The so called lightning mishap that Murescu mentions only a few lines before only occurred after Hera played a trick on the couple which forced Zeus to reveal his true form to Semele, and that killed her. In other words, this idea of going into a human form is not explicitly a Dionysian theme among Greek mythology. Here's the third quote I'll discuss, in which Murescu is speaking specifically about Jesus. Quote, In this version of the myth, the virgin mother has somehow survived her divine pregnancy. She has dragged her adult son to a wedding party against his wishes. He has just turned 30 years old, after all, and probably had other plans for this cool evening in January. Plus, the god of ecstasy is trying to keep a low profile. He's well aware that the wild, hallucinatory mysteries he'll soon be introducing to civilized folk are not for everybody. With heroic patience, he has waited his entire life for just the right moment to unveil his divine intoxicant to the world. Tonight is not the night, but his mother has a reputation to worry about as well. For three decades, she has endured the rumors and ridicule that plague any woman who claims to have birthed the Son of God. If only her gifted boy, disguised as an ordinary human all these years, could finally make his godhood known. Just one little miracle. At the beginning of this quote, Murescu strongly implies that Dionysus having a virgin mother is a common theme in his mythology. But we already know that Murescu cannot make this claim. Oddly enough, in this case, he makes the claim in an even stronger fashion than he did originally, when he merely suggested that virgin could be a possible translation of Kore. Additionally, much of the context Murescu gives for the wedding at Cana is simply not present in the original text. Nowhere in John 2, verses 1 through 12, which is the only place where the wedding at Cana is recorded, does John mention Jesus being reluctant to go to the wedding? Additionally, I cannot find any text that makes reference to Mary telling people that she birthed the Son of God and then being ridiculed for it. And nowhere in John does it seem like Mary is at all concerned with her reputation. Now, he might be taking poetic liberties here, but overall it still feels like his handling of the text is just a result of Murescu being a little too happy to play fast and loose with the details for the sake of framing. The fourth topic I would like to discuss deals with Murescu's idea of Dionysian miracles paralleling Jesus' miracle at Cana. But, since Murescu discussed this in two sections, it's really two quotes I'm dealing with. Here's the first. Quote, Every year in the district of Elis, on the western Peloponnese, for example, three empty water basins would be sealed up overnight in the Dionysian shrine at the appointed hour. As the Greek traveler writer Pausanias relates, In the morning, the priests are allowed to examine the seals, and on going into the building, they find the pots filled with wine. I did not myself arrive at the time of the festival, but the most respected Elean citizens, and foreigners as well, swore that what I have said is the truth. So too, on the island of Andros, just off the mainland, Dionysus' appearance, or Epiphania came in the form of a particular miracle every year on January 5th. A spring inside the god's temple would suddenly transform into wine, said to flow continuously for seven days. According to the naturalist Pliny, this unbelievable event was still occurring in the first century AD, and he interrupts his Latin text to record the name of the special holiday in Greek, the God's Gift Day. 
Dies Diadosia. By design, January 6 is now celebrated by Christians around the world as their epiphany, the day when the three wise men legendarily descended on Bethlehem, bearing gold, frankincense, and myrrh for the newly incarnate infant Jesus. In the above quote, Murescu makes several claims. The first is that, according to Pisanias, annually empty water basins are sealed up in the Dionysian shrine and miraculously filled with wine. This is true, but before we go on, we should note something important, because it will come up again. Pisanias wrote this between 150 and 170 AD. Historians roughly place the final form of the Gospel of John between 90 and 110 AD. Murescu then discusses an alleged miracle in which, annually on January 5th, a spring starts to flow with wine. In this case, Murescu is slightly off. If we look at Pliny's text, we find that it reads as follows, quote, In the island of Andros, at the temple of Father Bacchus, which is the Roman version of Dionysus, we are assured by Messianias, who is thrice council, that there is a spring which, on the nons of January, always has the flavor of wine. It is called Dies Theodosia. Though it might seem an insignificant detail, Pliny does not say the spring transforms into wine as mere rescue claimed. Instead, the water is simply said to be flavored like wine, but credit where it's due, the account is at least written before the finalized version of the Gospel of John in 77 AD. However, this would still be after the wedding at Cana, if said wedding actually occurred. Lastly, Murescu indicates that January 6th is the Christian epiphany specifically because of this January 5th holiday that Pliny reports. Note that they are different days. Unfortunately, when I looked into why the date of January 6th was chosen for epiphany, I could not find any definitive answer, and I found no reference to Pliny's report or anything regarding Dionysus. On this page, it is suggested that January 6 was chosen because, due to the organization of the ancient gospel manuscripts, congregations were likely to reach the section about baptism, which is one of the events celebrated on Epiphany, on January 6. Additionally, this reasoning is traced back to a report from Clement of Alexandria around 200 AD. Keep this in mind as well, because that date's going to come up again. The second quote I'll address relating to Mirescu's claims about Dionysian miracles is as follows. The god of ecstasy notices six enormous stone water jars off to the side and, against his better judgment, decides it's time to shine. He digs into his bag of tricks and whips out a combination of the annual epiphany miracles from the Greek district of Elis and the island of Andros. The god of ecstasy takes one look at the waiters, motions to the jars, and uses a great Greek verb, gemisate, fill him to the brim. First, we can note the implication that Jesus' miracle was inspired by the filling of jugs at the district of Elis is unfounded. At the very least, without information on when the Aeleans' tradition began, it's just as likely that their tradition was inspired by the stories of Jesus. In fact, since our information about the Aeleans comes later than our information about the wedding at Cana, 150 to 170 AD in the case of Pausanias, as opposed to 90 to 110 AD in the case of John, it is in fact more reasonable to think the Aeleans were the plagiarizers, not John. And that's if one thinks there's any plagiarism going on at all, and not just coincidence because wine is significant in their culture. Lastly, I'll note Murescu's analysis of the Greek word gemisate. Murescu says this means fill him up to the brim. Now, if it were not for the fact that Murescu drew specific attention to this word and called it great, I would just assume he was taking poetic liberty and I wouldn't even analyze it further. However, Murescu seems to be making a literal claim, and so I am going to analyze it. If we look into a Greek dictionary, this word simply means fill or fill full, and there is no added connotation of to the brim. Additionally, if we look at the whole verse, we see that it reads as follows. Jesus says to them, Fill, Genesis 8, the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Now, this is speculation, but I wonder if Murescu made the mistake he did in saying that the word meant fill them to the brim because he was looking at an interlinear like the one that I'm showing now. 
I'm guessing he probably got confused as to where Gemisate was translated due to the fact that Greek grammar doesn't always line up with the English, and Murescu thought the section where the waiters filled them up to the brim was the translation for Gemisate, when the translation for Gemisate was really just fill. Okay, the fifth or sixth quote, if you count the last one as two, that I would like to discuss is as follows. Quote, the divine birth is just one example among many. As mentioned earlier, Dionysus refers to himself as the son of God in the very first line of the Baki, using a phrase that is repeated later in the play. But there are many ways to communicate that in Greek. In three different places, Euripides uses the unique word gonos, which literally means begotten, alluding to Dionysus' emergence from Zeus's thigh after the death of his virgin mother, Semele. In the first chapter of John, the evangelist uses a similar sounding word, genos, not once, but twice. He is the only gospel writer who describes the nativity of Jesus in this way. When John includes the Greek phrase monogenes theos in chapter 1, verse 18, he means the only begotten or unique offspring of God. But in case it weren't obvious enough, John then goes on to say that Jesus is so close to the Father that he resides in God's lap, the Greek kolpon, or the region of the body extending from the breast to the legs, especially when a person is in a seated position, could not be clearer, unquote. First off, we already know the first sentence is a misrepresentation. Dionysus did not refer to himself as the son of God, but instead as the son of Zeus. On to his second claim, Murescu is correct in noting that gonos, meaning begotten, is used multiple times in Baki. That said, I don't think this is nearly as large a parallel as Murescu thinks. The word used in John, genos, is, after all, a different, though related, word. Additionally, it appears 21 times in the New Testament, and most of these occurrences are not references to Jesus. Are we to believe that all these uses are subtly hinting at Dionysus? No. In reality, the word was a common one used to discuss being born of another person or someone's offspring. Lastly, Murescu claims that John intended to evoke imagery of Jesus being near to God's lap as a parallel to Dionysus in the thigh of Zeus. This claim relies on the word used, kolpan, to mean lap, which is the only definition of the word Murescu provides. However, if we look at the word's entry in a Greek dictionary, we find that it may also mean bosom. What's more is that across six instances of the word appearing in the New Testament, it's translated as such four times. In fact, only once is it translated as lap. Additionally, I was able to track down the lexicon Murescu sourced for his definition. Here's the entry from which Murescu's translation comes. As we can see, even the entry Murescu sourced translated this particular instance of Kolpan in John chapter 1 verse 18 as bosom. When the very source from which Murescu is drawing contradicts his point, we can tell Murescu might be playing some mental gymnastics to form this connection. Furthermore, this entry contains a reference to additional information about this particular instance of Kolpan and points us to entry 34.18. Here is that entry. 34.18 lists the entire phrase used in John 1.18 as an ancient Greek idiom implying strong affection and closeness. This is relevant because it demonstrates that John is using a recognized ancient Greek idiom with a particular established meaning. This renders it even more absurd to think that it was really meant to be a reference to Dionysus. The next quote I outlined reads as follows. Quote, for a Greek speaker of the time, an immediate connection to Dionysus' one-of-a-kind birth from Zeus is almost guaranteed. The only thing that is unclear about this passage is the English translation, which ignores the word kolpan entirely, 
putting Jesus in closest relationship with the Father. Without the ancient Greek, the explicit reference to Dionysus has been entirely lost, and today all we're left with are weird stories about humans mating with gods. For the reasons listed in 5, we know this first sentence is wrong. Mirescu's next statement seems to reveal some level of ignorance about Bible translations. He says, The English translation is unclear, as if there is only one English translation. In fact, there are many, and most actually translate this use of kolpan as bosom. It is interesting to me that Mirescu chose one of the only English translations that didn't translate as bosom, which was the NIV translation. Frankly, it makes me wonder if Mirescu knew that bosom was a possible translation, but didn't want to reveal that to his readers, but ultimately I don't know his intentions. Additionally, if Mirescu looked at entry 34.18 of the very lexicon he was using, he would have seen why in closest relationship was used by the NIV as a translation for the phrase, as it is the meaning of the ancient Greek idiom in question. Continuing on, the next quote that I'll read is as follows. Quote, John's is the only gospel that records this event, meaning the wedding at Cana, the first miracle that launches Jesus' public mission. In Matthew, Jesus starts his career by healing a leper. In Mark and Luke, it's an exorcism. From the very beginning, however, John wanted his Greek-speaking audience to immediately associate Jesus with the God of ecstasy. As MacDonald states, the changing of water into wine was Dionysus' signature miracle. He goes on to quote the German scholar Michael Laban. The supernatural, miraculous transformation denotes the epiphany of Jesus according to the pattern of Dionysus. The juxtaposition of Jesus and Dionysus depicts Jesus as a god. Just as the Greek speakers of the time could hardly hear about the only begotten Son of God in the lap of the Father and not think of Dionysus, they could hardly hear about Jesus' first miracle and not think of the annual miracles from the Greek district of Elis and the island of Andros. Whenever wine appears out of nowhere on the Epiphany, only one god comes to mind. Credit where credit is due. Murescu is right that John's really is the only gospel that reports the wedding at Cana. Murescu then supports his claim that John wanted his audience to immediately associate Jesus with Dionysus with a quote that changing water into wine was Dionysus' signature miracle. Now, if we remember, so far Murescu never demonstrated a time in which Dionysus changed water into wine. The closest we got was an isolated report that a spring in a Dionysian temple became wine-flavored annually. In fact, I can find no instance predating 200 AD in which Dionysus was said to have transformed water into wine. This claim is simply wrong as far as I can tell. Aside from citing a German book that I am unable to read, because I don't know German, the only way MacDonald himself supports his claim is on page 41 of his book, where he referenced the same Ellis and Andros Island reports and an additional moment in the Baki in which Dionysus created a fountain of wine on the ground. The remainder of the above quote is just repeated in the already addressed claims about the word genos and kulpan, so I will move on. The final quote I will discuss from the first three pages of Murescu's book is as follows. Quote, and because the wedding in Cana was said to take place in January, on the same day as the Epiphany miracle on Andros, and around the same time as the Lenea ritual that launched the festival season of Dionysus, John's Greek speakers may have wondered what was happening behind the scenes. Unquote. Now, you'll see why I mentioned that the January 6th date of Epiphany is dated back only as far as 200 AD. It was a later tradition that developed, as far as we know, much later than the writings of John. There is no reason to think John's Greek-speaking audience would have thought the wedding at Cana was on January 6, and John's writings made no mention of the date at all. Mirescu, or whoever Mirescu gets his arguments from, is just taking greater and greater leaps in logic as we move on. 
this is where I ended my analysis of Mirescu's book, because the last pages on this particular section about Jesus dealt with my least favorite subject, geography. I will say Mirescu's reasoning and historical analysis was very flawed at essentially every single term, and it seems to me that he is entirely willing, whether consciously or not, to use incredibly poor reasoning and dishonest tactics to form arguments. And keep this in mind, even if he doesn't believe in Christianity, he knows that it's the biggest religion of the world, and its adherents see Christianity as being a matter of eternal life or damnation. This makes the topic perhaps the most important he could ever cover, and yet he's capable of being this mistaken when he speaks on that. Because of that, I am left with really an inability to trust anything he has to say about any other topics unless I do all my own research on everything else he says, too. In general, I would just say, be wary of what this guy says. I don't really think he's willing to do proper analysis, and it's pretty sketchy. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.